morning. Before I get started, I, I have to tell a quick story. When I was about 16, in the garage talking to my dad, and I remember somehow it came up. I looked at his shoes and said, Dad, how old are those shoes? And he said, Son, these shoes are older than you are when I was 16. And I thought, Man, that's old. Well, then I go to the Together for the Gospel Conference this uh, end of the week, and I looked around, and of our group, I was by far the oldest one in the group. Well, what happens is we get to this spot where none other than the notorious Clint Darst was there also, and Clint walks up and announces in front of a bunch of people, he says, Wilms, he said, one thing I know for sure, out of 12,000 people here, that's the oldest shirt anybody is wearing. <laughs> now, I made the mistake once of Luke actually came up to me and said, hey, I like that shirt. And you know what I said to Luke? This shirt is older than you are, Luke. <laughs> so it's funny how things come around. Um, the Together for the Gospel Conference was a rich time. And as a result... I had prepared, Michael had actually given me a couple months to prepare, so I have no excuse for running long, because when you have a lot of time to prepare, you should be able to hit your mark. But then the Together for the Gospel Conference hits, and then my heart's filled with all kinds of other stuff. So I finally finished uh, adding and preparing sometime this morning, which is typical, no matter what. Well, because I am a child of the 60s and 70s, the TV generation, you know, classic TV, um, one of the things that is in my childhood memory bank are lots of commercials. So there are times when I will break out into a commercial jingle and confuse anybody younger than me as to what in the world that is and where it came from. But there was one particular set of commercials that were very, very popular in the 70s from a broker, i.e. financial broker, called E.F. Hutton. Now, you older people will know that E.F. Hutton was, that was a big-time deal. Broker, and they were respected, and so forth. So the commercials went like this. When E.F. Hutton speaks, what's the rest of it? People listen. All right, very good. We have some that will admit how old you are, too. And so they would shoot commercials in a busy restaurant, and a guy would be talking, and there's all the clanging of dishes and people going every which way like a restaurant is. And he goes, well, my broker says this. And the other guy goes, well, my broker is E.F. Hutton. And he says, and everybody would immediately stop, lean in, and listen to what E.F. Hutton had to say. Another commercial had a girl reciting A, B, C, D in the classroom, elementary school teacher. And when she got to EF, she stopped and she went, EF Hutton. And all the kids leaned in as well as the teacher because they wanted to hear what EF Hutton had to say. Now, why do I say that is this. When God speaks, we should be listening. When God speaks, we should do as he says. So our passage today is found in John chapter 3, verse 22 through the end of the chapter, which is verse 36. I am going to propose to you that when God speaks, we are to hear his word, we're to trust him, and rejoice in the eternal life he graciously gives. All right, you get that? We're going to hear his word, trust him, and rejoice in the eternal life he graciously gives. So let's look at what God's word has to say to us today. And by the way, do not zone out while I read Scripture. When I read Scripture, it's far more important than anything I'm going to say today. And so do not zone out. Pay attention to the passage. And when we cover, because we're going to cover a lot of passages of Scripture, rapid fire. So do not zone out. All right, here we go. Revelation, uh, I'm sorry, the revelation of God to John, chapter 3, verse 22. It says this, After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, and he remained there with them and was baptizing. John also was baptizing at Anon near Salim because water was plentiful there, and people were coming and being baptized, for John had not yet been put in prison. Now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. 
And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who is with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing and all are going to him. John answered, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. He bears witness to what, has, what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. Whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. And let's go to the Lord in prayer before we dive in here. Father God, I thank you for the fact that you have graciously reached out as the superior by uh, millions and millions of times over us and graciously reached down and given us a handbook and a love letter that tells us how we can come to know you. Lord, I pray now as we open this passage and as we look at it over the next few minutes that you will help our hearts to be in tune. Lord, I pray that the Spirit of God will take the Word of God and do the work of God in the people of God. And Lord, for those that are here who have never yet put their faith and trust in the perfect one of heaven, we ask, Lord, that the Spirit will accomplish that even today. Lord, may you help me not to mess it up and not get in the way, but to clearly articulate the truths that are laid out here. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so... The very first thing we want to look at in this passage is what is the activity that is going on? The activity is detailed in these first few verses that, and I call it, um, there's discipling and there's dunking. That's what's going on, discipling and dunking. All right, that's baptism is the dunking part. But it was easier for me to remember discipling and dunking. Now, look at what it says in verse 22. It says, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, and he remained there with them and was baptizing. I want to talk about this just for a second because we have to connect to the context. Michael has just preached through John 3, 1 through 21 over the last three Sundays, I believe. And we're following in Nicodemus' discussion. We're talking about he's in Jerusalem. And this discussion of John 3.16, if you recall, most famous verse probably ever, flows right into this. But there is a definite break here in that it says they went into the Judean countryside and remained there with them while, uh, and was baptizing. Now, what does this mean? Israel is, a, is long and narrow like this. The bottom part was called Judea. Jerusalem is in Judea. All right? But... When it says they went into the Judean countryside, it's like they moved from the city, and so the city and city life out into the country. So I've got a few pictures up that I'm going to flash real quick. So where there's lots of people in the city, by the way, these are pictures from Jerusalem. I do some tour directing for Christian tours. There you see a picture from the Mount of Olives looking into the old city. And there's looking to Mount Zion up on the side, and you can see a lot of people. It's still a city. Back then it was busy too. There's a model of the city that shows how the temple retaining wall would have been in the houses that were, um, you know, during the time of Christ. That's when that model is built. And then we've got another model picture. There's a shot of the temple mount, the way it would have looked in proportion with Solomon's temple there. And then they go from the city and it doesn't take long. On the tour bus, we start to wind out of Jerusalem. And as you go down the hill, when you get down to the bottom of the hill, it starts looking a lot like that. They were somewhere in the countryside of Judea, okay? And so they're going to be there for some time, and we're going to take a look. First of all, let's talk about the discipling that was happening. Notice it says, Jesus and his disciple went into the countryside, and it says, and he remained there with them. All right, sometimes we read too quickly. I always say this when I'm teaching. We read too quickly, and we don't read with enough emotion, and we miss the fact that he remained there with 
them. Most scholars think this is a four to an eight month time period, somewhere in that range, when he remained in the countryside with them. Well, you know what you're doing when you're remaining with people? You're teaching, especially when you're the perfect teacher and the Son of God come down from heaven. You are teaching the disciples. He's discipling the disciples, the followers of, his, of him. I want to point out something to you. We're called to create disciples in our New Testament church, right? Here's what I know for sure. Making a disciple is not as simple as handing them a track or a piece of paper. It's not as simple as assigning them a book to read. It's going to take time together. Reading books, yes. Reading things that you can, yes. But coming together and helping people to understand what those things mean. One of the great things about this last uh, uh, conference that I had a chance to go to, it's the first one I've been to, is there was an opportunity to learn not only from the speakers, but learn from each other, because we were hanging out together and we were spending time together. And so there was a lot of good conversations that revolved around that. So Jesus was spending time with him. And that, that word about teaching, by the way, it really does carry the, the idea about enrolling almost in a course, like being a pupil, all right? And so this is one of those things, discipling takes time. I'm afraid often I am too busy in my head to make the proper time for discipling. And so I'm going to just announce from here because I have the opportunity. If there's anybody that would like to get together, I'm committed to disciple you and help you throughout the week. We'll get together and we'll do whatever over the next little bit. I want to model this by action, because I get convicted every time I study and prepare. The text beats me up and makes me realize what a worm I am. So I confess and now I want to fix it. So um, I'd be happy to begin that with anybody. Then the dunking is the next part, the baptism that was happening. First of all, it talks about that John was baptizing, and then it talks about that Jesus was also, and his disciples were baptizing. Now, first, let's look at the baptism of John. The baptism of John was a baptism of repentance. Now, some scholars will take, and people that are uh, throwing rocks at Scripture, and they'll say, well, John never talks about repentance. And I say, hogwash. He just doesn't name it specifically like the other synoptic gospels do, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Because in all of those books, it's called a baptism of repentance. So when John writes it here, and he talks about them baptizing, that's what it is about. It is calling for the repentance from sin. Now, I'm going to prove it to you by reading just a couple of things here. Luke 3, verses 3 through 6. It says this, And he went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall become straight and the rough places shall become level ways and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. I want to stop just for a second and talk about this idea of making the path straight or smooth would be another, uh, another word that, w in fact, the New American Standard uses the word smooth in its translation. The idea is this. When we trekked from Lincolnton at 5.30 in the morning to drive to Louisville, the part of the interstate that I hated the most is the part I always hate the most, which is over the mountain and I-40, because it's hills and twisting and narrow and it is much more difficult to drive than when I get up on the other side of it in Tennessee and I just roll and it's flat and it's straight. There's a little white knuckling in the mountains. The, the idea here is that this repentance of sin is to prepare the way for the Savior to do his work, for you to receive him. And it's the idea of that smooth and level. Um, and I, I love how Scripture often uses uh, Jesus especially, items that we understand. Look at the birds of the air. Look at the flowers and talks about items we understand and uses those to give us spiritual truth. 
Well, Matthew 3, 11 through 12, another one of the gospels says this. I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. And then Mark chapter 1 says it this way. John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now, quickly, I'm not gonna, these aren't on screen. You just have to listen. Here we go. Some other passages in the New Testament, just so you know, it isn't just the synoptics that talk about it. First of all, Isaiah 30, an Old Testament reference, verse 15. For thus the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, has said, In repentance and rest you will be saved. In quietness and trust is your strength, but you were not willing. Then Luke 3 adds to it and says, Therefore bear fruits in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourself, We have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that from these stones, God is able to raise up children to Abraham. Luke 5.32 says, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Luke 15.7, I tell you in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Then Luke 24, 47, repentance for the forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. Acts 5, 31, he is the one whom God exalted to his right hand as a prince and a savior to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Acts eleven eighteen. when they heard this, they quieted down and glorified God, saying, well then, God has granted to the Gentiles also the repentance that leads to life. Acts 20, 21, solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Acts 26, 20, but kept declaring both to those of Damascus first and also at Jerusalem and then throughout all the region of Judea, where we are in this text, even to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds appropriate to repentance. Then Paul in Romans 2, 4, or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? And then 2 Corinthians 7.10, For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret, leading to salvation, but the sorrow of the world produces death. 2 Timothy 2.25, With gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition. If perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. The Lord is not slow, about his promise, 2 Peter 3, 9, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Last one, Luke 5, 31, and Jesus answered them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Folks, there are people who will make the claim that repentance is not necessary for salvation. I offer the proof I just offered to you. That is nonsense. The fact is that we are all despicable sinners in the sight of a holy God. And if you don't think you're a despicable sinner, I pray God will reveal it to your heart today, because you are. And I am too. One of the things we saw at the conference was clips of R.C. Sproul. R.C. Sproul passed away and went to heaven. A great Presbyterian Bible teacher and scholar and communicator. And one of the things that he said in that clip is he said, the attribute of God that is the only one that is accentuated three times is God is holy, holy, holy. That's the Hebrew words when you string those together to say, you better pay attention. I mean it. He's holy. He cannot tolerate one sin. So when I stole candy out of my mom's purse when I was told not to, that's enough to damn me to hell. Do you understand that? Do you understand that this is not a teeter-totter we're talking about of I do enough good deeds to offset my bad and then I get led into heaven. 
That is the lie from the devil, and every world religion I've ever studied is based on it. It is works-based. You have to do stuff in order to please God. Christianity is you can't do anything to please God, but you can repent and turn to Him. And indeed, Jesus Christ has pleased God on my behalf. Well, not only is the baptism of John a baptism of repentance, but it also pointed to the Lamb of God. So John 1.29, that uh, was covered earlier in our series on John, it says the next day he saw Jesus coming toward him, that's John the Baptist speaking, and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So the, the baptism is one of repentance, but also it is one that points us to the fact that Jesus Christ is going to be the perfect sacrificial lamb that is going to take away the sin of the world. Well, the baptism of John the Baptist is going on, but we also have the baptism of Jesus. Real quickly on this one, people sometimes get confused. Well, they were baptizing close to the same area, not too far away. Were these baptisms different materially or not? I'm going to say to you that these were the same type of baptism. There were baptisms to repentance. All right, this was not the one wasn't that Jesus was performing Christian baptism with his disciples. It was rather make way, get ready. The Messiah, the Lord, is here. And of course, Jesus' disciples, even in this early stage, could say, and he's standing right over there. Okay? It is a baptism of repentance. Both of them are preaching the same thing. There isn't a competition here. It is the same type of baptism. But also, the message is still the same, to repent and get ready. Real quickly, John chapter 4, verse 2 tells us, by the way, Jesus himself wasn't baptizing, but rather his disciples were baptizing under his authority. Okay, And that's kind of important because it also lets us know that just like we do something if... Uh, if you contract with somebody to wipe your wife out, right? If, you know, and every 48 hours or dateline, you know, I mean, it's always, the, it's always the spouse. It's almost always the spouse. Is the contracting and the handing the $5,000 to the FBI agent, who always is the hitman uh, in those stories, you are as guilty of murder as the person who did it. Um, and here the authority, by the way, that connects all the way back to the garden with Adam and Eve. Adam is indeed our representative of the human race. And when he falls and sins, he rebels against God, and we are tainted because of Adam's sin. Then we, we confirm it by sinning constantly and overtly and accidentally and every which way but loose. Clint, Re Clint Eastwood reference there, right? So we have the baptism of Jesus. Now, the time of this baptism and when this is happening, notice what it says, verse 24 in brackets there, it says, for John had not yet been put in prison. Why is that there? Well, John, I think, is identifying to us that his gospel is a supplementary book to Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Most scholars will, will agree that John has written some 30, 40, maybe even 50 years after Matthew, Mark, and Luke. There is no doubt he knew what was in those books, and there is no doubt that under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he's going to fill in some gaps. He is also going to make things more understandable. But don't forget, as Michael said, I think as Josh said, this book is written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Son of God. You know, back at the John 20, uh, 30 and 31, he gives us the purpose for his writing. So he's going to cover some of the same things, but sometimes in a different way. It is not contradictory. It all comes together like beautiful woven fabric. Well, this time that he talks about, for John had not, not yet been put in prison, this places this between the temptation of Christ. You remember when Christ was taken into the wilderness and tempted? And three different times Satan misquoted Scripture. Like many pastors in pulpits today are misquoting Scripture, which is what the devil does. And he then replied with the proper interpretation of Scripture. Three different times he quoted from Deuteronomy. And he defeats Satan in that temptation. All right? This happens after that and before he goes to Galilee. So it's a time period the other Gospels don't cover. And we know that Matthew 4, I'm just going to read quickly, 11 through 13. Then the devil left him. That's at the temptation. And behold, angels came and began to minister to him. I find that verse fascinating too, by the way. The perfect son of God. 
with the full Holy Spirit, with no sin, and yet after the temptation, 40 days in the wilderness, and three encounters with the devil, in his humanity, had angels come and minister to him. Really interesting thing to think about. Then verse 12, Now when Jesus heard that John had been taken into custody, he withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the region of Zephulon and Naphtali. All right, so this tells us this is a, a part that isn't covered in the synoptics because of how this is phrased. By the way, Jerusalem is down here, all right? There's my, my map. Up here is the Galilee in the north. It's 100 miles away. The vast majority of Jesus ministry, public ministry, happened in the Galilee, a hundred miles away from Jerusalem. The vast majority. So when you see Capernaum, you are seeing the headquarters for Jesus' ministry, most likely right out of Peter's house in that seaside town. I'll take you there if you go to Israel with me. One of my favorite spots to go um, is that little fishing town of Capernaum. It's nothing but ruins now because Christ proclaimed, if the miracles would have been done in you, Capernaum, that... Uh, If that would have been done in Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have repented, and yet you didn't. It's one of the cursed cities, and indeed, nobody lives there now, except maybe a friar, a Catholic, might live there on the grounds, but it's not a real city. Um, All right, so this puts the the place and the time. Um, It also, I want to just quickly give you a sidelight here. For John had not yet been put in prison. All right, what is John going to be put in prison for? This is John the Baptist. He's going to be put in prison for saying to the ruler, hey, you are committing immorality by taking that person who is not your wife and and making her yours, right? And so he calls that out, and that's why he's going to be put in prison. So here's what I want to put out to you. John the Baptist was following Christ like nobody else except He's actually a forerunner who's also following Christ. Really interesting. And this man is thrown in prison. And while he's in prison, he even is confused as to why he's there. He writes back and he says, what's going on? Paraphrase. And Jesus sends back and said, the dead are being raised, the lame are walking, the blind are seeing, the the glories of the Lord are being proclaimed. So he confirmed to John the Baptist, things are okay. But ultimately, John the Baptist was beheaded. All right, so hear me out. If you're not a believer today, let me tell you something. You are not promised a better earthly life by coming to faith in Christ. In fact, you may end up persecuted and separated from people and places that you love. How's that for a winsome approach? You are not guaranteed a glorious life that is nothing but flowers, butterflies, and daisies when you come to Christ. In fact, John the Baptist ended up in prison and beheaded. Um, A pastor of the largest group of followers in Charlotte, okay? I'm going to share two of his tweets in the past week. He said this, when I follow Jesus, favor follows me. And I said to a friend, tell that to John the Baptist. Because the kind of favor he's talking about is worldly favor. He's talking self-help. He's talking money and fame and prestige. And then later in the week, he said, you can't always get a new start to your story, but you can write a new ending. Eh, wrong. You don't get to write your ending. Total nonsense. And that's being proclaimed from that pulpit this morning, I'm sure, in various forms. All right, so what happens after this? We have some discussion that launches. And the discussions come from this baptizing. Look at verse 25. A discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. Talk about that just for a second. This is the idea. In Judaism, there are ceremonial washings. There were times when, for instance, the priest would completely bathe and wash before he would go offer sacrifices. When there was leprosy and you were declared clean, there was a bathing process. There is this much written about washings in the Old Testament, and then the Pharisees and the scribes and the rulers of of the law had made it into this. So, I mean, they have all kinds of extra biblical washings. And so I'm sure that this discussion was, hey, what is this baptism? Isn't that what we do with 
Okay, so there was that little discussion about this idea of purification. By the way, in Israel, anytime you go someplace, if uh, there's been Romans there and Jews there, and at different times, you will find what looked like bathtubs built, which were ritual baths, and you know that Jews were there at some point because they were practicing ritual bathing. For instance, in Masada, um, those ritual baths are still in the real remains that we that we see. So. Here we see this discussion, but what really happens from that is there's a discussion about why Jesus was stealing the focus from their leader, John the Baptist. So John the Baptist's disciples are like, man, a lot more people are going to Jesus' disciples than are going to you. And that bothered them. Now, it's easy for us to stand here and go, well, it shouldn't, but I, I want you to come back to... John the Baptist was probably the most authentic guy they had ever met. He lived his faith. This was a great guy. And they were like, what's happening? Why are, why are he's losing influence? And so this brings this discussion. It, it ends up on John's lap. And so John is going to have the answer here. And that's what we're going to focus the balance of our time on, is John answering this discussion. By the way, do not forget that Jesus said about this John the Baptist, there's no greater man born among women than this man, all right? And so I want you to understand that because John the Baptist, of all people, could have had uh, pride in his life, and he continually suppressed and removed it to point to Christ. By the way, this idea of attaching ourselves to a man rather than to the God-man is a tendency that we have, is it not? In fact, Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 11. He said, For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, I follow Paulus, I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? So in Corinth, there was discussion about, well, so-and-so baptized me, so I'm, I'm a little better than you are. Right? And then there's the holier than nows that, that said, Well, I'm of Christ. I don't think this was, they were trying to unify. I think they were actually trying to do like I do when I'm having arguments with my fellow uh, compadres. And I'll say, Oh, I just believe the Bible. You know, it, when we disagree on a point, I always say, Well, I always claim the Bible. I just believe the Bible um, to indicate they're wrong and I'm right on issues that aren't crystal clear. Okay? Um, so in this case, let me just bring it down to Freedom Church. We've had three pastors over the course of our existence. And each change, we found out that some people were disciples of Eric Reel. Some people were followers of Clint Darce. And some people may be following Michael White. I'm going to tell you, none of those three guys want you to follow them. They want you to follow Christ. Imitate them as they follow Christ, that's fine. But this is not about a man. It is about the man. It is about the God-man, Jesus Christ. And we are susceptible to fall into that. Well, how does John answer this? Quickly, verses 27 through 30. John answered and said, A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. So first of all, he says, My existing ministry is a gift from God. Whatever ministry you're in is a gift from God. Now, sometimes it's hard to imagine as you're cleaning that explosive diaper for the fourth time in 45 minutes that this is a gift from God. But you know what? Every baby wipe that has to come out and every ministry that has to be done is a gift from God. You're having a chance to touch people's lives. I want you to understand if God has given you a gift in an area, even sometimes when you get discouraged or it seems like nobody appreciates it, God has given you that gift. So you can rejoice in it. So when mom complains that the diaper isn't like she does it, you can say, God's given me this gift. I'm doing this for him. 
not for that nitpicky mama. Now, all of that said is this. There isn't a single one of us that's been in ministry that at times doesn't get discouraged. You know, the, the running joke with pastors, and I'll, I'll ask them, I said, how many times do you quit on Monday? And I'll sometimes have them say, oh, you know, 20, 30 times a year. You know, after you finish Sunday. And you finish, and then somebody jumps you and says, that was a crummy sermon. Why didn't you visit me last week when I was sick? I didn't even know they're sick, right? I mean, the weight of the ministry is, is weighty. And so often, messages are preached, prepared for all week, and then you get dumped on and beat on. And sometimes, a lot of pastors will say, well, I quit on Monday. They take off Monday, then they say, I quit on Tuesday, because Monday they can recover. But we should realize our existing ministry is a gift from God. Um, notice this. Verse 28, you yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. His job was always pointing to Christ. John the Baptist in his ministry was pointing to Jesus Christ. It was not pointing to himself. It was pointing to Christ. Our ministry should be pointing to Christ. No matter what it is that we're doing, we do it as unto the Lord. Then he compares his ministry as being the best man at the wedding of his dear friend. Look what he says. Verse 28, the one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom, bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. So this idea of groomsmen or, or being best man. You know, I was mentioning the last time I was in Louisville where the conference was, I was there for a wedding of some friends of mine. And how many of you remember that are old like me, when you're in your 20s, you were going to lots of weddings. You know, it's like, that's kind of the, the season for it, you know. And I was in Louisville the last time, some 25 years ago, maybe 30, um, and it was for a wedding. So this idea of a wedding, I've also seen weddings in Jerusalem. Um, and guess what? They're the same there, except maybe even more festive. They really have a great time at weddings. How many of you women really, really love to go to a wedding? I'm just curious, right? Uh, lots and lots of women. How many of you men go, eh, but when I'm there, I go, you know, that's me. I'm not, I'm not really looking forward to it, but I get there, I go, that's a joyous occasion, and I can fall in, and I can say, this is great, right? Now, in the bride, uh, or the best man's job, number one, he knows his place. He's not the star of the show, right? If the best man was constantly photobombing the couple as they're taking pictures with, you know, behind them and doing little tap dances while the bride comes down in order to draw attention to himself, that'd be wrong, right? He's not the star of the show. He is the one who is there to support his friend. Number two, he knows the groom and is delighted to see and hear him being happy. He sees and hears his voice. So this is one of those things where I remember uh, the day I was getting married, I was singing a pop song at the time, and by Laura Brannigan, I still remember the, the artist, and I was singing it, and my best man said to me, "Ah, oh, shut up. But he meant it in the nicest of ways, <laughs> because he knew I was excited about marrying my wife. And so he knows the groom and is delighted to hear his voice. Number three, he rejoices in the happy occasion of his dear friend marrying the wife of his youth. There is a deep and abiding joy as he watches this happen and he is there to support it. By the way, Isaiah 62 gives us a picture of weddings in, in, the, in Scripture in the Old Testament. It says, You shall no more be termed forsaken and your land shall no more be termed desolate, but you shall be called my delight is in her and your land married for the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. So we see this idea of rejoicing at the weddings. Um, number four, he consciously makes the effort to exalt the groom while minimizing his own performance. You know, the best man, if things go smoothly and nobody notices the best man except for the groom, that's, that's his goal. It's kind of like officiating. I love basketball and played it growing up. And I was not very gracious to officials because 
they never called the game right. If you're an official, I'm sorry, just miss so much. So what people say is, you know it's a good officiated basketball game if what? You didn't notice the officials. It's kind of what this best man does. is not noticing him, but noticing the one that we've come to exalt. So John uses this picture of a wedding in order to say, that's what I'm doing. I'm pointing to Christ. I want him glorified. I want him to be the star of the show. I want you to see him. I want to rejoice in him. Well, what is the foundation of John's belief? All right, so he's got his beliefs, but what's his foundation for these beliefs? And that's what we get in chapter uh, 3, verse 31 and following. It says, He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. He bears witness to what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. Whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. What's the basis for his belief, the foundation of his belief? First of all, is we're talking about This one came from heaven, all right? This is the Holy One that has come from heaven. It is obvious to John that this trumps anybody who has come from earth, as he talks about. He repeats it twice in just a couple of words. From heaven. This is Jesus who came from heaven, all right? And that, that, when I say trumps, I always forget. Card players. You know, Trump takes all the other suits, right? And so it doesn't matter what your card is, Trump takes it when you throw that down. That is what he's talking about here. He's from heaven, he's not from earth. Matthew 11, 11, I've already read, I'll just quickly say, don't forget, this is John the Baptist who Jesus said, there has been no one greater than him. So when he says, pay attention to the foundation for my beliefs, he means it, all right? I'm pleading with you to pay attention to John's foundation this morning. The bridegroom tells us what he has seen and heard in the heavenlies. So he comes and he bears witness to what he has seen and heard. So here's the really neat thing. Jesus existed from eternity past, all right? And he takes on skin and comes down, but he is the living, breathing word of God. He knows exactly how it started and how it finishes. So in Revelation 19, verse 7, it says this. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true words of God. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, You must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So there is coming a great marriage supper of the Lamb. If we take this marriage analogy, you know, one of the neat things is the reception. Everybody eats and greets and has fun and talks to everybody. The glorious supper of the Lamb. We sing about this in uh, the, the Feast of Zion talking about that in that song, and it's a glorious truth. And yet, John says, in spite of the fact this is the one coming from heaven, mankind rejects his authority. It says that no one receives his testimony. Then he he follows it with whoever does receive it. So what he's saying, a vast majority reject this testimony. Folks, let me illustrate this like this. Let's make a deal. Monty Hall was the original guy that did it. Now I think Wayne Brady, let's make a deal. And it's like there's curtains and boxes, right? Well, you choose this one or this one, and then sometimes you end up with a goat with a, you know, with a broken down cart where you traded in a car accidentally, right? This is like that, except the curtains are open. It's like both curtains are open. You can receive the glories of the one who tells you how it is in heaven, Or you can put your trust in your own self, 
You can put your trust in Stephen Hawking. You can put your trust in Richard Dawkins. You can put your trust in Donald Trump. You can put your trust in any human being, and you are going to be sadly, sadly mistaken. Because the glories of Christ are worth forfeiting everything this world has to offer. If you're hanging on to something you think is more precious than Christ, I'm pleading with you. It isn't. Yet mankind rejects his authority. The good news, those who do accept are siding with their belief and trust in God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Those who do not are actually siding with the lesser God, little g, and in effect are saying this, I don't believe you to the very one who has given them the breath in their lungs to say that blasphemous words. Oh, I'm so thankful I don't stand in the way of the wrath that is due my sin. The fact is, is that Jesus Christ paid the price for my sin. And by simple repentance, abhorring my sin, turning from it, and turning to Christ, I can be saved. We also see this bridegroom came and had the entire fullness of the Spirit of God in him. It talks about that the fact he has the Spirit without measure. You know how believers now have the Spirit? We do have the Spirit living within us. If you truly have repented of your sin, put your faith and trust in Christ, you have the Holy Spirit of God within you. But you know what we do? We quench him. We grieve him. We sin against him. See, Jesus did none of those things. So he had the full Spirit of God in his humanity also. This bridegroom has been given all that the Father owns. Okay? The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. This also would play out later on where we'll, we'll see where Jesus says, the Father has given these to me and nobody can snatch them out of my hand. All right? This... Jesus is the God of heaven in human skin. Then the final thing is the bridegroom has the ability to remove the wrath of God from continuing to sit on man's chest, shoulders, head. You pick it. I've got some allergies. This is the time of year, you know, when the, uh, the allergy season, those fellow sufferers know that that green dust, it just, it brutalizes. So I feel sometimes like I've got somebody sitting on my chest and it just stays there for a while. Let me tell you what happens when you reject this one who came down from heaven and gives these glorious words. You have the wrath of God sitting on you already. To Michael's message of the last two weeks, if you do not believe in the Jesus who has paid the price for your sin, you are condemned already. It's as if you look in the mirror and wrath of God is tattooed on your forehead. Pig pen. The old P Peanuts cartoon, Charles Schultz had pig pen. And pig pen constantly always had a dust cloud rolling around him. That's how I picture the man who rejects the good news of the gospel. You are continually filthy before God. The judgment of God resides on you and is in fact tattooed on your head. Man, Repent and come to Christ. He loves you. He desires for the very best for you. Do not rely on your own self-righteousness. Do not rely on somebody else's instruction who has not come down from heaven to give you the glorious good news. Trust him. He loves you. So to sum up the basis for John's basis for belief, his foundation, I want to read to you Hebrews 9, 11, 14, uh, 11 through 14. It says this, But when Christ appeared... As a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and cows, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the sprinkling of deviled persons with the blood of goats and bulls and with the ashes of a heifer sanctifies for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, Purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And then look at John 1.36 as we conclude. It says, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. 
But notice the wording here. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life. You see, this is not a belief that is intellectual belief, young person. This is not, oh, I believe Jesus. I believe he died, was buried, and rose again. I'm going to heaven because I believe that. No, 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 no. This is a belief that triggers obedience. So we don't earn God's favor, favor by obeying, but we will have a heart's desire to obey God when we have come to him in repentance and faith. So this idea of obeying God takes away this idea, by the way, of come forward, say the magic bullet prayer, fill out a card, get your offering envelopes, and we pronounce you on your way to heaven. That's nonsense. Nonsense. If that's all it is, your life should be changed. You are a new creature in Christ when you really put your faith and trust in him. If you do not have a, a, the desire to obey Christ and his teaching today, man, you're pretending. You need to repent and come to Christ. My heart's desire is that we wouldn't have anybody under the sound of my voice that would reject this good news. Don't choose a broken down donkey when you can have a limo, okay? Don't take the, the riches of this world over the eternal glories that are in Jesus Christ. John Piper said in a message once, he said, if I lived 70 years in this life and had nothing but heartache, nothing but trouble, nothing but problems, it'd be worth it for the eternal glory that awaits me. I plead with you, don't continue to reject. Don't trust in something less than what he has given us here in our forgiveness of sin. Hebrews 12, 25 says this, See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we, re if we reject him who warns from heaven. Rejection ensures the wrath of God continues to be tattooed on your forehead. It's already there. He's going to execute it one day. It's a down payment. Just like if you put your faith and trust in Christ, He gives you the Holy Spirit of God to indwell as a down payment. You've got a down payment one way or another. You are going to be fulfilled one way or another. So, I plead with everyone here, hear His word today. Trust him. Rejoice in the eternal life he graciously gives. Revelation twenty two seventeen 17 says it this way. The spirit and the bride say come. And let the one who hears say come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. I invite you to take the water of life that comes without price. Take this Jesus, this glorious one from heaven, who has given us the words that we should live by. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for the opportunity we have to study your word. Lord, I'm thankful for the fact that you have made it simple enough that a child can understand the basic truths, and yet, Lord, it is so far above us in so many ways, we realize that you're not a God who we can completely figure out until you reveal yourself fully to us in a glorified body in heaven. Lord, I thank you that we have the opportunity to gather and to study together. Lord, I pray that there won't be anybody that would leave from the, the clear instruction of your word in, in these passages and would leave today thinking that they have a relationship when they don't or, Lord, that they would reject a relationship when you graciously offer one. We just ask that the Spirit of God will, will work and move in their hearts. Lord, we just thank you so much for your love for us and the fact that uh, you loved us even while we were spitting in your face and shaking our fists with our sin. Lord, I thank you for my salvation. Somebody who's unworthy, and yet you have washed me clean. I pray that you will do that for those that have never experienced that today. May you bless the balance of our time. Lord, I thank you again for the opportunity to be in your presence in your word. Amen.